Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, my name is Barbara Parker. I have the pleasure of serving as the president of the Emeriti Association. And it's my pleasure to kick off the initial general session and lecture series uh, that has been organized by Vice President Richard or Dick Matson. And we look forward to the presentation today. I'd like to start by introducing myself. Um, I retired in 2000, end of 2018. I'm a breast medical oncologist, administrator, clinical researcher, and a senior physician leader was at the Morris Cancer Center. I'd like now to um, introduce our executive committee, our board of directors, um, Dick Madsen, who will be leading the discussion this afternoon. Um, uh, Dick, do, would you like to introduce yourself? Dick, Matson, would you like to introduce yourself or I can introduce you, I have your bio. <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute. No. Okay, uh, I'm Dick Madsen. I'm a retired professor of sociology and uh, China studies. Uh, and uh, I've been at UCSD since... 1978, and um, I've been involved in many different committees and activities here on the campus. Wonderful, thank you. And then I see um, Peter Gorovich, who's our past president. Peter, would you like to make a couple of comments? Oh, hi everybody, yes, I'm past president. It's my pleasure to be with all of you today. I am came here in the political science department of which I was chair at one point, and then I became the the uh, founding dean of what was then uh, the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies. I came here in 79, a year after Dick, and he was on that committee with me, and I became the dean. It's now named the School of Global Policy and Strategy, and I've done a variety of things on campus here as well, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I don't see David Gus, who's our treasurer secretary. Um, I would like to uh, introduce uh, uh, Rick Boland. C could you make a couple of comments as a member at large? Yeah, so I'm I'm Rick Boland. Uh, I first came here in 1995 as head of gastroenterology, uh, but I spent most of my time studying tumor genetics in the laboratory. Um, and I'm still, I'm, although I've been retired for a while, I still do, I'm involved in a number of mentoring uh, programs that are, you know, broadly, out there. Wonderful, thank you. Mandy Butler, a number, another member at large, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, I um, uh, started at UCSD relatively recently compared to some of the other members in 2004. Uh, I came on uh, as a academic coordinator for the undergraduate labs, basically saw uh, operation for all the undergraduate labs in biology and was a teaching professor in biology. Wonderful, thank you. And then Christine Hunfeldt. Yes. Member at large. Everybody, I'm very happy to see some participants and interested hopefully in joining us at one point in the Emerita Association and also the Retirement Association. I was a long time professor in the history department with a specialty in history, Latin American history. And I also was the director of the Center for Iberian Latin American Studies and very much involved with the Institute of the Americas on, on campus. So you might have seen me around. And I'm here at UCSD since 1990. So somewhere in between Richard and Peter. And Wonderful. Mandy, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce Vanya Bayon, who's our Retirement Resource Center director who is going to uh, lead some announcements about our new facilities and meeting space uh, that is now available starting uh, just last month. Vanya? Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for that. Let me screen share a few slides so you can uh, see what we see when we walk towards our center. We are now located in University Extension Building A. A lot of you are familiar with this location. Uh, it's what used to be OSHER and extended uh, learning or extended studies. Um, in our new location, we have various parking lots uh, nearby. Uh, as you can see from this photo, handicap right in front, visitor and A spaces, as well as B spaces and adjoining lots. Um, so we are here, if you are on North Torrey Pines Road and you enter Muir College Drive, I believe now it's also called Exploration Drive, Building A 
is where you will find us. And parking lot 303 is the closest one next to us. There are parking permit stalls here that will make it easy for you to access um, our center. And we hope to have several in-person events this year. Um, our offices are open currently during summer uh, hours. It's 10 to 3, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But this will be extended during the fall quarter once it actually begins, September 26, I believe. We'll be here 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. Um, and this is just a general layout of what our office looks like. Um, so when you walk in here, there is a general reception area where we can go ahead and answer any quick questions you have or advise on any uh, more multifaceted questions or concerns that you might uh, want to address. We have a shared conference room here where we are planning to host several of our upcoming book club events. If any of you are EA book club members, um, please look forward to having our own space to, to meet here. And then we have uh, four administrative offices and storage here um, at the end of, of the location. Um, I'm very much looking forward to being able to offer more in-person support. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to emeriti at ucsd.edu or retiree link at ucsd.edu. Vanya, can you tell us about the open house that's planned so that everyone can look at our facilities? Yes, of course. So we do have an RRC open house this Saturday, uh, it's scheduled for Saturday, September, uh, Saturday, October 26, excuse me, 2 to 4 p.m. So it's a mid-afternoon event. It should be a lot of fun. We'll have hors d'oeuvres. We'll have a spoken program where you will hear from the RA president, the EA president, Barbara Parker, as well as the EMP chair, um, general announcements about upcoming events for the year. And you'll get to actually see the location yourself, walk through, and take a look at, we'll have photos from past RR uh, see events. We're doing this open house in combination with the Retirement Association's 40th anniversary celebration. So the RA has been around for a while um, and it's a sister organization to the EA. Uh, they work a lot of ways together. Um, any other questions that anyone on this call might have about our new location? Any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Um, Vanya should, Emeriti, um, Association members wish to use the meeting space for non-Emeriti Association meetings. Is that possible? Is there, can it freely be scheduled or is it only for Emeriti Association events? So that's the fun part about being here. So we have the University Extension facilities all to ourselves for the first year. So should you want to host an event here, um, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to work with anyone who wants to schedule a small group meeting. We also have a classroom space that fits 50 people. Um, so we're happy to help out where needed. Please do reach out. Wonderful. Wonderful. Great to know. I see that David Gus, our treasurer secretary, joined us. David, we did introductions of the board before you joined. Would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is David Gus. I'm Retired uh, 11 years now. I started at UCSD actually as a resident uh, in internal medicine. Dr. Bluestein, I see, is on this call. I'm sure he remembers me from very long ago. I joined the faculty in 1979 and then the very nascent division of emergency medicine and uh, eventually became the head of that division and then the uh, interim chair when I took it to uh, academic chair status, and um, I've enjoyed my years at UCSD, both as a full-time faculty member and then uh, in the years of my retirement, and mostly the last several years as a participant in the Emeritus Association. Thank you. Any other board members that I missed? If not, I'm going to turn the program over to Dick Matson, our vice president in charge of programming, and he will make some comments and introduce our speaker for today. Well, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the program for this year. We have, I, I think, uh, a very rich program of uh, lectures uh, every month. Uh, Today, we'll, I'll, I'll introduce him in a, in a few minutes, uh, is Le'Veon, Professor of Music. Uh, next, <clears throat> in October, there'll be um, Peter Evans, who is uh, Associate Dean of Social Science now, uh, but uh, also a co-director of the Center for Practical Ethics and a sociologist who specializes in issues connected with biomedicine. 
Uh, then on uh, November, we will have um, uh, uh, a very good talk on on the election uh, by um, uh, almost unblocking his name, Peter, your colleague from political science. Um, uh, well, there you go. Okay. Uh, uh, Gary, Gary, Gary Jacobson. Gary Jacobson. Gary Jacobson, one of the foremost uh, uh, analysts of, of, of elections. So he he will um, give some analysis and comments of whatever happens in this November election. Uh, then in uh, January, there will be Andrea La LaCroix, the professor of public health, uh, a very distinguished professor uh, who does very important work on, on longevity and, and aging. Uh, and uh, then in uh, February, Fauna Foreman, professor of political science, who's also uh, helped establish some very important issues connected with kind of public life in the border area, including on uh, this side of the border, but also in Tijuana. Uh, then in March, John Carruthers was vice president for vice chancellor for health sciences. Uh, in April, we hope Margaret Lennon, who is now retiring as the director of the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Uh, and then uh, finally on in May, uh, Rudy Kosla will uh, meet with us at the uh, our final meeting at the faculty club. So um, uh, if any questions or comments about this, uh, uh, please uh, let me know. Great. So now, uh, Dick, would you like to introduce our speaker? Is he has he signed on? I see him here at the. Uh, okay, the... wonderful. So then, then yes, you will be in charge. There he is. Okay. Okay. Great. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Lei Liang. He's the Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Music. Uh, so we begin this whole series of lectures with someone from Arts and Humanities, uh, but his work extends uh, far beyond just, just the narrow confines of, of the arts. Uh, a significant part of his work, of course, deals with uh, kind of dialogue East and West with uh, Western traditions and Asian traditions, Chinese traditions, musical traditions, but also it extends into things like uh, connection between music and, and STEM because he's done very uh, interesting, very important, innovative work with uh, uh, the Qualcomm Institute uh, uh, multimedia uh, kind of presentations of, of both music and, and visual things, and uh, and also with with things like modern politics, because some of his recent compositions had to do with issues connected with uh, uh, sex trafficking, immigration, uh, the border, and so forth. So he truly uh, covers a tremendous number, uh, wide range of things, uh, brings together many, many facets of what we in a university are concerned about. Uh, and he's won many, many, many uh, awards. Uh, um, we won't go into now, he won the Rome Prize in 2000 uh, recent, recently, but, and, but also very important, he's won the uh, he's finalist for Pulitzer Prize and uh, almost any major prize you can think of in uh, field of composition. So, uh, with that, uh, Lay, will you? Uh, floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm very glad to be here. I see some familiar names here. I'm very glad to see Stefan. I'm happy to see Joe. Oh my God! Wow, <laughs> this is fantastic. Yeah, well, very glad to be here. Perhaps I can. Uh, just um, say a few words about how I got here. I cannot believe I've been at UCSD for 17 years now. Um, uh, it's almost inconceivable to say that number, but when I see my son who was 15, I said, okay, yeah, this is real. Um, I know, right? <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, this really is the place I've been uh, always wanted to be. I. Um, uh, I came from China, uh, as Dick mentioned earlier, I was in Beijing 
Um, after the Tiananmen Square protest, I was a, pro, a participant there as a high school student. Um, I left uh, Beijing, uh, left my family in 1990, and uh, first came to uh, Texas, Austin, Texas, for two years as a high school student, and then uh, went down to Boston to get all my degrees, first at the New England Conservatory of Music and then at Harvard. Uh, but UCSD is always the place I want to be. I actually got to know UCSD uh, before I uh, knew anything about San Diego <laughs> because uh, our composition program here is really uh, very special. Uh, we have uh, almost uh, every major Ivy League schools uh, professors uh, coming from our graduate program, Harvard, Stanford, three out of four faculty members of composition came from UCSD. Um, so it, it's just a very special place. I wanted to come here for my PhD program, um, but uh, it's um, uh, the place that after I got here really transformed me. I, I think a lot of you will share that feeling that our students have a lot to teach us. I certainly um, changed the way I compose music. So um, last 17 years has been a period of transformation. Um, I'm a classical composer. I'm a classically trained composer. Uh, very rigid kind of Russian style training when I was uh, growing up in Beijing. Um, and I've always wanted to get away from a conservatory ever since. <laughs> so coming to university, this is one, one other um, aspect of my aspiration um, is to think uh, of a new ways to make music so that I really feel like um, I belong to a university. Um, so I will just start by saying that last year I launched a lab at Qualcomm Institute, just simply called Lay Lab, and members of our lab uh, consists of, uh, I think I'm the only composer at the lab, um, but uh, mostly um, consists of uh, engineering professors and uh, uh, professor of geology from SIO, um, uh, uh, oceanographers, and a lot of software developers. <laughs> and I think uh, uh, this is really the kind of place where uh, it's part of the UCSC tradition is to redefine the materials and methods we use uh, uh, to make music. Uh, because uh, for many years, maybe for centuries, we've been making music about nature, you know, just in the Western uh, repertoire alone. Uh, you think of Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, you think of Lamar by Debussy, all these pieces responding to nature. But here is a real chance that artists can work with scientists and really understand how we think about nature in 2024. Um, Beethoven didn't know that whales could sing. <laughs> so all these things, we no longer want to write music like as if we still live in the 19th century, you know, pulling out a beach chair and just think about ocean as a peaceful place. No, ocean is full of crisis. <laughs> so um, this is the kind of thing I really enjoy learning. And I um, uh, think that's very important for artists to, uh, to respond to. Um, so uh, extremely happy to be here. Um, let me um, share my screen. Is there... Yeah, so uh, let me just uh, talk about this a little bit. Um, I have among many of my interests, I'm also author of uh, my, I'm working on the ninth book now, and uh, and this is in addition to what I really should be doing, which is to compose now over a hundred compositions, including operas and opera, orchestra pieces, and lots and lots of chamber music. Um, and one of the things that I have been very interested in doing uh, is um, uh, exploring the music of Mongolia. I, I was a, uh, uh, well, I, when I grew up in Beijing, one of the uh, very close friends of our family, uh, Mr. Wu Lanjie, who is uh, the greatest scholar of Inner Mongolia on music, uh, he was a close family friend. So he always came to our place. And I don't know if you realize how much the Mongolians love to drink. Uh, so if, if there's any hint of alcohol, uh, he would start singing, and he could sing all night. <laughs> and uh, that was one of the most beautiful memories of music uh, in my childhood, because I grew up, I was born in the last years of the Cultural Revolution, and there's a lot of uh, happy propaganda music 
uh, in the airwaves. And I never liked happy music, maybe because of that. Uh, but when Ulanjie came to our home and sang these Mongolian, what they call long songs, um, they're absolutely transcendental for me. Um, this is a music that is as beautiful as as the Gregorian chant, very spiritual, and they uh, were singing of a mother's love, lots of lots of songs about being away from home. Um, there's a lot of repertoire about uh, uh, nostalgia, and they also sing of courage and friendship and all these subjects that are quite rare in uh, the Chinese folk songs. So um, I fell in love with it, and I um, have written, composed a long series of works inspired by Mongolia, including uh, a, uh, a large string orchestra piece commissioned by the New York Philharmonic uh, over, over 12 years ago. Um, and I kept thinking why I love Mongolian songs so much. Not only that they're beautiful, but they're asking questions that we're all asking today. They've been asking that for over a thousand years. A lot of these songs are about home. And why is it important to think about our home? The Mongolians, uh, as you know, had the once had the world's most uh, terrifying army. <laughs> it was conquering the world. But why, when we listen to Mongolian music today, there's very little music uh, that is martial in character. Uh, most of the music that we hear, like what my teacher taught me, are long songs singing of how much one misses their home. Well, the answer is very simple. They were warriors. <laughs> they're warriors busy conquering the world. They're, so they're always away from home. They miss their home. And I think probably everyone here um, is away from home. Uh, I certainly live very far from where I was born, where I was raised. And this raises the question, what is home for us? And if we think of a place uh, where we grew up, that's certainly a sense of home, but also uh, perhaps we can now elevate that concept and think of the entire planet as our home. And those questions that Mongolians been asking in their long songs for over a thousand years, what happened to our home? What has become of our home? Those are very, very deep questions <laughs> that we're still asking today, uh, perhaps with uh, uh, with a greater sense of urgency. Uh, and uh, many p different fields are asking the same question. So I feel like my music is, uh, uh, in a way, a response to these questions um, that I've been asking ever since I left Beijing, my physical home, uh, my cultural home, uh, and that certainly started the journey uh, uh, for uh, mm. a search for my spiritual home. Uh, and now uh, there's a lot of reflection on what is happening to our physical home. And to move on to the next slide. So this is a little bit, I think I think uh, Dick will get a kick out of this. <laughs> These are traditional Chinese calligraphy. And this particular character is the word home. Uh, this is found in the silk script preserved in the Ma Wangdui tombs, uh, dated 2000, uh, 206 BC to 9 AD. So it's pronounced as xiang, the word home. And here is the word that has the same pronunciation uh, with a slight uh, different, uh, slightly different intonation is the word xiang, meaning resonance. And is particularly, this particular calligraphy uh, is written by the Han Dynasty um, calligrapher Liu Kuan, uh, who was active 120 to 185 AD. And it's very interesting to think of the, the, um, the composition of this word, because the word resonance or simply sound uh, in music consists of two parts um, in Chinese uh, uh, eograms. Uh, the upper part is the one that I just show you, meaning home. And the bottom uh, uh, radical uh, means sound. 
So together, the word resonance means the sound of home. You know, just it's a beautiful poetic and evocative definition of the word resonance. And here's another, well, I love these old characters. So <laughs> this is one of those things I really like to do, go through all these old calligraphy books and find uh, treasures in them. This is a, another way of writing the same word, of course, completely different composition, uh, but it means the same thing. It, it's again, the same word xiang, but it's preserved in the Shi Chen Stili, uh, 168 to 169 CE. Uh, and on the left side is the radical four sound and the right side is landscape. So this can be a definition of reson resonance uh, by way of soundscape. Um, so just think about that. You know, what does it really mean to hear resonance? You're hearing the soundscape of your home. Uh, and if you use that as the definition for the music we're making, uh, it's the soundscape of home. Either we think of church music, that if, if we have anything to do with, with uh, the spiritual tradition, religious tradition. I personally have a very strong religious tradition uh, by way of my grandfather, who was a minister. Um, you listen to the church music, that sound evokes uh, your sense of home. Uh, but of course, uh, the cityscape of Beijing, whenever I hear the sound of bicycles, <laughs> I think of how I grew up in Beijing when there are thousands and thousands of bicycles <laughs> in the street. Uh, I even feel very nostalgic just to hear sound of a bamboo uh, 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 boom, uh, uh, the, the, the things that they used to sweep the 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 grounds in, in Beijing. And that is the sound that awoke me every morning. Uh, you see old men trying to clean the street. Uh, and these sounds were the cicadas. I, that's the other thing I miss very, very much. Uh, I didn't like it so much. It was so noisy in Beijing. The summertime is, um, uh, Beijing is uh, full of this cicada choirs. I think in Japan, it's the same thing. <laughs> the summertime is full of these amazing cicada sounds. Um, we don't have them in San Diego. So uh, whenever I hear that, well, I did encounter it in Palm Springs. There was a lot of cicadas in Palm Springs, but for some reason I never heard it uh, in San Diego with the same kind of intensity, very interesting. But these are the sounds of places that we know and places that we uh, somehow identify ourselves with. So sound is a very, very powerful medium, medium for that. So now let me switch gear a little bit. This is a um, landscape painting by a great Chinese painter, Huang Bing Hong, uh, who lived from 1865 to 1955. I'm a student of Chinese traditional painting and calligraphy. I was extremely fortunate when I was studying in Boston uh, to be very close to um, uh, people who are uh, deep in, in this lineage of Chinese traditional paintings and poetry. And so uh, this really has become my, my, uh, my passion. So uh, I'm very happy to share this painting with you. Um, this is not available in the public and um, it, it's an absolutely amazing work thinking of this painter when he painted this set of album leaves in 1953, he was 87 years old and he was blind. There's nobody like that in Chinese history who could do this. And I will tell you um, uh, my take on this. It's um, of course, there are many ways to, to think about the painting, but I, uh, I started to analyze this painting. You know, this painter I became fascinated with since I was a freshman in college. I hand copied his books uh, because his um, commentaries on paintings are so incredibly interesting. Um, and it was very rare to see his real paintings. Um, I was only lucky enough um, about 10 years ago to encounter a great collector based in uh, San Francisco. And uh, uh, it was a very interesting meeting. Uh, he was an elderly gentleman uh, and he um, 
make sure that I have to earn his trust so he could show his collection to me. So he tested me for 10 hours um, about Chinese painting and history. And then we started to talk about this particular painting, the painter, Hong Ming, who is not the most well-known painter, but uh, someone who has fascinated me so much. So he asked me, why you like Hong Ming Hong so much? What's so special about him? Of course, I already hand copied his books and memorized many of his quotations. So we had a wonderful conversation. And at the end of that conversation, he said he too loved Hong Ming Hong. And he had collected more than 600 pieces by Hong Ming Hong. So he invited me back to Berkeley the next year and showed me the, his entire collection. Um, and we had Peking duck and <laughs> Chinese tea. That was probably the one of the happiest days of my life. So I was able to borrow uh, Hong Ming Hong when this gentleman called Dong Ying uh, was his name. When he passed away, he told his family foundation to be sure that they would continue to support my research into Hong Ming Hong. They would loan the Hong Ming Hong original to us. So uh, I had my eye on this particular set. So we were able to borrow this uh, and uh, brought this set of uh, Hong Ming Hong's album leaves to the structural engineering building. And we did uh, analysis. And I at that time, this is about 10 years ago, I, I thought that the only thing that interested me is if I we're going to engage with technology, I want to be able to see things that we couldn't see or hear things that we couldn't hear. Um, that was the that was the the threshold for for our uh, for any research we're going to do at Qualcomm Institute. So here's a photo of the original being mounted on this. Uh, basically, it was a robot um, designed by. Uh, the old robot engineer, uh, James Strawson. Uh, Samantha Stout uh, in this photo is a uh, cultural heritage engineer. So uh, our visual team was able to uh, design the robot so that this original painting was divided uh, into 1,800 uh, images. Um, and it took no more than two hours to uh, take the photos uh, by the robot and then stitch back together this uh, high resolution photo uh, uh, and then recreate a landscape. After all, the Chinese shan shui uh, landscape paintings um, uh, are called landscapes. I mean, I wanted to be able to recreate uh, a landscape that we can uh, write uh, like a virtual drone <laughs> inside of the painting by by using a joystick uh, that we use in games. Um, so this was the first step. Here is a sample of Huang Ming Hong's uh, same painting, but being scanned by UV fluorescence imaging. So through this, you can see, this is um, used often by our visual team to detect um, places where the painting needs to be repaired. For example, you can see in the upper right corner the, the cracks uh, in the rice paper. And those are the places you have to be very, very careful. Uh, there are also materials that can be found through this imaging technique so that we could tell what was done to the paintings uh, since it was painted um, and were there any additional materials added to the painting. So it's almost like a detective work that was very interesting. And this one um, is very unusual, it's called transmission imaging because the light was not in the traditional way projected onto the surface of the painting. This is light being projected from behind the rice paper. So you can see how Huang Ming Hong, which layer of uh, ink he applied first. Uh, how did he splash ink? How did he use dry ink at the end to highlight textures? Um, so this gives you a very different kind of uh, diagnostic uh, to to see the process of these papers. And here are some of my favorite um, because the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this uh, album leaf was uh, divided into 1,800 images. Uh, the amazing thing is that every image is a beautiful painting in itself. So uh, this is one of the details. This is one of the 1,800 images and um, they're just absolutely stunning uh, because you can see this 
blind painter, <laughs> he was able to create uh, uh, many layers. Um, uh, it's almost seeing um, uh, the forces of nature at play. For example, this is another detail, one of my favorites. Uh, you can see their, um, what I call something, the transparency of time. Um, this is a picture of time, uh, meaning that uh, he was moving his brushes uh, at different speeds, and they're all frozen in this moment. Uh, you can see, for example, the left side uh, was done with a very, very wet brush um, that uh, was executed very slowly, and he was letting the uh, water and the color to seep into the rice paper. So you can see a lot of details of how, how that created new textures. And you can see that's almost like a cloud-like shape, the contour. That was done by the, the glue <laughs> that was mixed into the water. Because of the presence of glue, you have this almost like a halo effect um, uh, at the edge of the water. And then to the right, you have uh, another layer with a slightly different, more yellowish uh, 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 ink splash. And then on top of that, uh, the darker um, ink was painted with uh, dry ink and it was done with um, uh, great speed um, because uh, you see all those white spaces left uh, in the brushstroke because it was, it was touched, it was barely touching the surface of the rice paper. So it was leaving all these white empty spaces. Uh, so in one image, you basically have three different uh, temporality uh, uh, coexisting. Uh, I know this is gonna uh, 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 make Stefan and I start to have some conversation because Stefan is, uh, writing, has written some really beautiful passages about time. And here is just an extraordinary uh, image of what uh, how time uh, can be made transparent when we can use this kind of imaging techniques. Uh, by the way, this is barely visible um, uh, to the naked eye. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we want to engage with technology only if it can reveal things that we could not see, could not hear. And I think to see this Flamingo set of paintings um, using this technology gave us something that we um, even better than looking at the original. So that's why I felt it very, very exciting to do. And here is a result of uh, stitching 1,800 images back together. Uh, and you're seeing just a corner of that painting, of course, projected onto 32 monitors. This is a wall of monitors uh, at the Qualcomm Institute uh, Theater. And um, with a joystick, you can actually travel uh, inside of this painting, um, like you're on a drone. And it creates a very interactive personal experience with the image. Uh, I show this only because I'm standing in front of that monitor and you can see the proportion and uh, what a spectacular landscape uh, our technology can help us uh, construct um, and help us get into this amazing projection of this blind artist inner vision of a landscape. Um, here's the list of rather technical terms. Um, uh, I think uh, all I need to say here is that uh, thinking of the music that has been composed, inspired by paintings, I was not satisfied with the the old approach, you know, you can almost do anything with painting. You can just write anything and say, this is in response to painting. You know, either it gave you some peaceful feelings or uh, you can say that I, 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 I hear color and I'm writing music in some um, uh, very um, richly coloristic way. That's all fine. Uh, but I wanted something more concrete. And um, what I wanted to do with my team um, is to create what I call sonic brush. I wanna be able to use Huang Minghong's own painting theory to create sounds. Uh, so um, this is not the place to kind of give a full comparison of the sound and the painting, but uh, these are the some of the softwares that we developed. 
that will allow us to paint like Wang Minghong did, except that we're using sound. Um, here is a um, map of the spatialization of sound. Uh, I put it in the title, the Wang Minghong's calligraphy. He was an amazing calligrapher. He wrote the two words shan and shui, meaning mountain and water. Together, these two words combined mean painting. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, mean uh, landscape painting. So mm -hmm. we were able to take this word and project um, its trajectory uh, into a spatialized auditorium so that uh, part of the music, when you're sitting inside the auditorium, you can feel the sound is floating around you, but they're floating according to Hong Minghong's calligraphic strokes. So you're sitting inside of his uh, inside of his calligraphy, feeling the movement of his brush. You know, again, this is only possible because of the technology we have today. Uh, here's the interesting stuff. Finally, we come to this moment, we can hear something, but this is very unusual. Uh, this is X-ray fluorescence analysis of Hong Minghong's painting. Uh, and what you see is very much a very simple elemental peaks chart. Uh, chart. And the one that is uh, to the left that has the highest peak is a very unusual um, element, barium. We had no idea why Huang Minghong was using an American chemical <laughs> in, in his uh, Chinese landscape paintings. And nobody actually knew. There was no documentation how he created these secret recipe uh, when he was mixing things, um, mixing elements and materials uh, for his painting. But uh, our kind of detective work discovered this very interesting and surprising element that Huang Minghong was using. Uh, when I look at this chart, uh, I thought, wow, I want to hear it. I want to be able to hear this painting. And what if we turn this elemental chart into a sonic filter so we can really hear the uniqueness of the sound. So here I'm gonna play you an example. I hope your speakers will be able to press. It almost sounds like a wind, but this wind is gonna be different depending on um, where you collect your data. But this is what Wang Minghong's uh, uh, materials uh, sound like when we pass them through our sonic filter. Oops, I don't know what happened. Uh, could you hear it? No. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, you hear some wind sound? Okay, all right, I'm sorry. I don't know why uh, my um, my uh, PowerPoint just uh, stopped by itself. Let's see. Um, anyways, um, I mean, maybe it's just some uh, pink noise to your ears, but I loved it. <laughs> when I first started, wow, we were able to hear the painting. And of course, with every painting, with a different kind of chemical composition, you will hear a different kind of wind. <laughs> I find that to be very, very exciting. Um, all right, let me start my PowerPoint again. Uh, share screen. Okay. And what did I do earlier? I did. Okay. Um, slideshow. By the way, Dick, when should I finish so we have a little time to chat? Oh, well, maybe 10, 15 minutes. We can have them chat. Okay. Sounds good. Five. Yeah. Sounds good. Great. Um, let me see. What if I press presenter view? OK. OK, now let's listen to some. Oh. I want to go. Yes. All right. So um, again, this is this is the same painting. I'm going to play you the music that was inspired by this entire process of working with scientists and robotic engineers and cultural heritage engineers and software developers. And then that led me to recreate my orchestra. But this particular image is very special 
um, this was done with what's called raking light. So the light is actually projected from the side of the painting. So if I can enlarge this image, you will see all these irregularities on the surface of the painting. You know, the rice paper itself is full of life. <laughs> it's full of uh, unpredictabilities and um, it's not a abstract flat surface. You almost have to struggle with it when you're painting with it, uh, painting on it. So um, this is just one of those really fascinating um, aspects of what does it mean to paint as a Chinese uh, landscapist. Um, and let me show you, well, I did write a very big orchestra piece that was just played um, at Carnegie Hall, in Carnegie Hall, and um, this is the piece that um, uh, got me a, a, a very nice award in the classical music world. But um, I wanted to show you just one ex uh, short excerpt of how this music changed the way I breathe, uh, because looking at this painting, there is a particular pacing that you have to uh, adapt when you're watching Chinese traditional landscape paintings. Uh, there's a certain way of watching. I've observed that with my mentors and when I was studying in Boston and the collectors and people who live with this tradition. Um, all of that changed the way I perceive and, uh, and that got translated into sound. And the sound itself, as you know, I was interested in the sound of uh, chemicals and uh, all these things. And they gave me the materials uh, to be able to build my music on particular harmonies that were directly derived from analysis uh, of the painting. So let me play for you a little bit of what that uh, resulted in as an orchestra piece. Very strange. I'm sorry, there's always a problem with my PowerPoint today. It just shuts down by itself. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's protesting something. I don't know what's going on. Uh, let me see if I still can manage to turn it back on. Um, but you heard a little bit, right? <laughs> okay. Well, there is a, a, a feature article in New York Times about this piece uh, that came with the entire piece uh, as sound file. So maybe at the end of this, I can send uh, Dick um, uh, the link so you can you can enjoy it uh, at your leisure. Uh, but let me try to move on. Maybe is playing music kind of uh, uh, seems a little challenging for a PowerPoint here connected with Zoom. So. I could try to do things without playing so much music. Let's see if that helps. Um, okay, here. I can wrap up in a few minutes, but um, uh, you can see these two large characters, right? Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. So this is the Chinese um, word for 大学, university. And it literally means great learning. Uh, this is a calligraphy by the Qing Dynasty uh, calligrapher Deng Shi Ru. Um, I love that phrase, uh, great learning, you know, and I keep thinking, what make learning great? <laughs> and um, and uh, one of the things that uh, is really important for me is that, uh, as I said earlier, that I I was born and raised on a conservatory campus and got uh, my uh, important trainings uh, at the conservatory. And I always wanted to find a different way to approach uh, music. And uh, one of those things that I have been able to do here at UCSD is to um, find myself a place that I can really learn instead of thinking that I, I'm just going to do all these things 
within the walls of a music department with a concert hall and all these practice rooms, uh, I'm going to just think of the whole university as one unit and uh, engage as much as I could with scientists and, uh, of course, other artists and uh, try to figure out things that, that help us think about new ideas, new materials, new methods, new technologies, uh, so that we could really create something that is um, uh, impossible to create uh, until our time. So um, here's uh, uh, my lab membership. <laughs> These are team members. You probably know some of them, like Professor Foco Cuester of Engineering Department and uh, uh, Joffrey Jones from Oceanography, Professor Emily Chin, geologist from SIO. Um, and uh, we have worked together um, to explore the sound of the Arctic. And that was a project that took six years. And it really changed the way I think about music altogether because uh, don't forget, I was a classically trained composer. Um, you know, my earliest introduction to piano is, you know, through the music of Bach and Brahms and Beethoven. These are what's called the three big Bs, you know, in Western uh, musical canons. It is with the uh, oceanographers who uh, took me on a kind of a sonic exploration of the Arctic that I discovered uh, the new three big Bs for me. <laughs> for, I'm learning uh, new things from uh, beluga whales, uh, bearded seals, and bowhead whales. I call them my big bees. <laughs> and they're, you know, of course, uh, amazing capacity to make sounds and perceive sound and use sound to communicate, uh, either socializing or making music. Um, incredible experience. So um, I explored this site. Uh, you're seeing an image of a uh, recording site where uh, John Hildebrandt, our, uh, uh, I think he's still the current uh, Senate chair, right? Or he's just about to step down. Uh, his lab, the whale acoustic lab, placed uh, their hydrophone right in the middle of this location uh, where you see the image uh, from, from NASA and record uh, for the entire years at a time. And um, uh, every year when the, when the ocean opens up, uh, in late summer, um, they send in the ship and to uh, re retrieve the, the, the hydrophone, the data, um, bring it back to SIO and we can open it and listen to it. Um, so we use these resources to make uh, new pieces. I'm playing a little bit sound of, of the ice. Itself. I'm so afraid that the computer is going to <laughs> stop again. So I stopped right there, but that was the sound of ice. And I think it's one of the most beautiful sounds I've ever heard. It's very interesting because now I teach uh, undergraduate students and um, most of the students don't uh, have the kind of background in classical music when they came to UCSD. Um, you know, we might know Mozart uh, and Bach, but these students uh, today, they, they have never heard of these composers. Uh, uh, in high school, they probably hear a lot of film music and uh, animation uh, soundtrack. Um, so when I teach our undergraduate students, it would take some convincing uh, for them to appreciate the kind of things I'm trying to share with them. You know, a, a Brahms intermezzo. Uh, why is this so beautiful? I have to take a lot of time to try to explain to them. But if I play some of these sounds that I I'm working with, uh, uh, working on with oceanographers and my lab, for example, the sound of ice, um, they get it right away. <laughs> it's very interesting. I remember uh, during one of those sessions, I it's a what, three hour long class. I told them, okay, let's have a break. You can all leave. I'm just gonna put some sound on um, for a break. And nobody left. Everybody was glued to their seats and they listened with such, was so almost like a deep meditation. Everyone realized how beautiful that was. Um, and everyone realized the connection with that sound, even though none of us is from the Arctic. Uh, 
we realize how important that sound is. And we realize that is, to go back to the topic of today, they realize that's the sound of home. Uh, this is our planet Earth. This is our home singing to us. And it's very, very important. It's giving us some message that we have to understand as well. So uh, right after that class, student came to me, asked me what they could do to be part of our team and, and help uh, do some of the research we were uh, conducting. But anyways, it's it's a very interesting connection that this sound made with, with my undergraduate students. So here is a, uh, um, a uh, new set of, uh, well, we did this in the last year and a half. Uh, we use, um, uh, continue what we did with uh, earlier exploration of using X-ray fluorescence analysis uh, and get the elemental peak data and translate that into harmony. We did it more systematically. So we uh, published a set of what I call mineral harmonies. Uh, this is of course working very closely with geologists uh, at SIO. Uh, and this is one of those elements, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Uh, but anyways, this is the elemental peaks and then when it's translated, this is the harmony. Uh, of of what you have just seen. Um, and I have a feeling that there is a way we can hear these data in a way that would inform of something very, very important because listening uh, uh, has great potential, uh, but it's kind of um, underestimated in the environment of learning. Uh, we tend to share knowledge uh, through words uh, and through visuals, but uh, if you hear the harmony, you can feel a lot of things and you can connect with it, you can experience it. So all of that data can be turned into a real experience. Um, and that's what I find to be really empowering. And I, I think that maybe with some help, we can get um, get this available to, to even K through 12 kids so that, uh, so they can understand uh, how to make their own minerals, for example. Um, make their own virtual rocks by combining these harmonic chords together. But so there are two books being published. One is uh, a book of 188 uh, mineral harmonies and another one is 128 using a slightly different uh, methodology. Uh, I wouldn't go into uh, the details here, but I'm just sharing with you today that how exciting this whole process is. Sorry. So um, the second methodology we use is uh, basically called sonification through X-ray spectroscopy. Um, so uh, this basically transposes uh, elements uh, 50 octaves below so that uh, our human ears can hear these uh, frequencies. Um, and uh, in some way, that is a more precise way to do it. And we, we published a second book. And if you think about it, Beethoven probably uh, used no more than 10 chords for all of his sonatas and symphonies. <laughs> he could make all that beautiful music when he was given just a palette of uh, uh, 10 different harmonies. And now we have a book of 188 harmonies and another book of 128 harmonies. Just imagine how much beautiful music we can create out of that. Um, and here is a uh, uh, AI jet uh, generated uh, image of the mineral uh, that we were analyzing uh, with uh, geologist Emily Chin. So uh, my seminar tend to bring in um, many different fields uh, from scientists to, to visual artists and composer and performers. So let me end with a, a quote uh, going back to the Chinese landscape painting tradition. Uh, Dick, you can read the Chinese on the bottom, but let me just read the top part. This is a quote from a great Chinese landscape painter who was active uh, in Song Dynasty, 1020 to 1090. And he described how to um, construct a landscape. And here he says, a mountain looks this way close by, another way a few miles away, and yet another way from a distance of a dozen miles. Its shapes change at every step, the more the farther one goes. It looks this way from the front, another way from the side, yet another way from the back. Its aspects change from every angle, as many times as the points of view. Thus, one must realize that a mountain contains in itself the shape of several dozen or a hundred mountains. 
It looks this way in spring and summer, another way in autumn and winter, the scene changing with the seasons. It looks this way in the morning, another way at sunset, yet another in rain or shine, the manner and appearance changing with morning and night. Thus one must realize that one mountain contains in itself the manner of several dozen or hundred mountains. I love this. I, I feel that um, if we come back to the word shan shui or landscape, um, it's kind of a uh, projection of an idealized landscape. It's Chinese painters were not really trying to replicate what nature does. It's more about um, finding its spirit <laughs> and recreate an idealized landscape by traveling in it and uh, constructing an idealized landscape by observing hundreds of them uh, and create your own, you know? And I, I think of universities very much like that. You know, we can create an idealized place for great learning. And this learning is informed by so many perspectives. Uh, I used to be trained by musicians but why not adding beluga whales and bowhead whales and, uh, and minerals and geologists? All these people should come to the training of our young musicians' minds so that when we make music, we are so much more informed by what was going on. And that will stimulate us to imagine and create in ways that, that were impossible until our time. So um, that's the end of my talk. Let me exit and see if I can um, have a little chat with whoever might have some questions. Well, well thank, thank you very, very much. Uh, this is indeed uh, great learning. Okay. Uh, <laughs> pulling together many, many things. Uh, let me just open it up to uh, some people in our audience. Uh, one thing I would notice is there's a deep Taoist to kind of, you know, uh, background to both the paintings and and the music too in a way the Taoist there's a primordial unity to everything and with many different aspects coming into being in particular aspects and so forth and some way your music is like that too right oh <laughs> thank you yes the um the Taoist philosophy in the Chinese context is very very liberating and um, one of the things that's very interesting, you know, the Chinese painters really re uh, refer to the Taoist uh, scriptures very often um, because of its um, direct uh, uh, evocation of emptiness. Uh, and this, of course, is so relevant to ink painting. Uh, the, the, em the empty space right behind me, you know, what do you do with emptiness? How do you tri uh, think of emptiness as non-empty <laughs> and that is uh one of those questions that every chinese landscape painter had to deal with and um uh i i feel like the Taoists uh kind of figure out an x-ray vision to look at these things uh you know thousands of years ago being able to perceive uh, life and spirit and energy in empty spaces and that kind of infused chinese paintings with a very very important discourse uh, 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 what do you see beyond the parents, right? Stefan, I see your hand. Good to see you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we had so many good conversations. I miss having those conversations with you. Yeah, it's not How surprising that, not. <laughs> that, that your talk has generated some uh, reactions or and comments and, and, and affinities. Um, I, I really like how, how you're moving towards non-representational ways of, of seeing and, and thinking and, and sensing and communicating. Uh, and um, sometimes I wonder, it, it, I mean, I, I really like that you're adding music because you, you added passage uh, to the painting. And, and so what I wanted to, I mean, there's two things that, that uh, I, I, I'm working on now that, that you yeah. touched on. What is perspective? A and the other is noise. Mm. Um, and what did Wong visualize as he was painting? Because he say he's blind. He so what blind he's visualizing and what he's painting is, is not our world of seeing 
2D or 3D imaging or, or perspective. So, so, and and you know, I felt like you were trying to get that out because on the one hand, what what when you added the music to it, I mean, one thing I was wondering is he is his landscape painting not a spatial painting, but a temporal painting, a passage. Wow, that's beautiful, isn't it? And, I mean, and, and when you're playing the wind and when you're evoking the wind to it, you know, mm -hmm. when you, you're talking about the different brush strokes, the seeping into the paper and all sorts of, there's all sorts of, uh, and you're pointing out the multiple temporality. So I'm just wondering, what is he visualizing and reproducing as he's painting this? Because it's not our notion of a two-dimensional painting. Yeah, no, it's just this, well, let me, let me, I love this topic. I I think of Chinese paintings um, as a place that time and space is all warped into one thing. Uh, if you watch Chinese paintings, uh, you know, think about what does it mean to make a hand scroll or, or, or uh, unroll a painting? What does that really mean? You're holding hand, you're holding, I'm sorry, you're holding time under your fingertips because time is not abstract in Chinese uh, uh, landscape paintings. You have to unravel that painting and that process itself, you're interacting and controlling and breathing with time. And going uh, back and forth. Yes, exactly. You know, with, I, I was thinking of some of these um, albums, especially the long scrolls, there's nobody, uh, Maybe the emperor could have a space like that to un, you know, unroll the entire thing. Even at the Metropolitan Museum, you can't open up that painting <laughs> in its entirety. There's no way. So the right way to do it is to have a tiny little table and you just open from left to right and you're looking at it uh, from right to left and you're just opening up almost like seeing a film, except that film, you have to kind of open it just with your hand and it's at your arm's length and you discover all that drama, it's all right under your fingertips. So there's this particular sensation of touching time. Um, Huang Minghong, when he was painting, he imagine that he, he was, this is for maybe seven, eight months when he was blind from cataract. Um, when I sit, see this set of paintings, just painted during these few months when, when he was blind, um, I felt he was just touching his brushes. He was using the brush as an extension of his uh, tactile experience, that contact that he had. So he didn't even care much about whether the brush was of any good. You know, he, he was famous of using really poorly, you know, poor quality brushes. He, he couldn't care that as long as he could touch it, you know. <laughs> um, but it's a very tactile experience. And um, it's a... Fascinating, we tend to think, you know, like how we were taught uh, in Chinese art, we, we have all these albums that we produce these paintings, uh, but that's very opposite of how that art should have been experienced by viewers. Um, without touching it, without taking time, you know, into your arms, you know, under your fingertips, you're missing the whole point of what does it really mean to see and touch all at once. And you're missing all the drama, you're missing all those narratives that's going on uh, and their interactivity uh, between, the, between the painting and yourself. You're missing that whole dialogue. So um, I, I think, uh, uh, Stephanie, you're, you're touching on something that is so important for Chinese. I don't really hear people talk about it enough because the museum has created totally in textbooks that created a complete new illusion of what that painting is. Um, it's just a total misrepresentation uh, of, of, of you know, uh, what is this to, 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 to perceive landscapes. Um, so you were talking about the second part, I can't remember, what was the second question? That was also extremely interesting. Oh, the second one is noise, but I see Peter with oh, his yes, hand yeah. up. So, so I mean, uh, yes. If if we have time, you have yeah, time. yeah, we will, we we I'll can also do the chat. Uh, we'll we'll find time to do a Zoom chat. But noise is right. such a rich word for our team because just imagine when we are dealing with the sound from the Arctic. Um, what is noise? <laughs> well, yeah, and it bugged me because you eliminated what what I thought was generative. Yeah. Well. 
But, yeah. but anyway, that's a, that, that, oh, that, it was a necessary my... step. But anyway, I'm sorry. I mean, okay, I'll okay. stop here. You know where Lay is now and where his lab is and so forth. And... <laughs> okay, let's go to Peter. <laughs> have to stop, you know, in about three, four minutes. So okay. so maybe at least one more, but Peter. Yeah. You need to unmute yourself. Unmute. Thanks very much. I enjoyed this a great deal. And my question is not unrelated to the noise question, Stefan. So maybe we can go there. Hi, Stefan. Nice to see you. Um, uh, I was interested in why you think that the students like so much listening to the Arctic ice uh, question and uh, why they enjoyed, why they sat there and listened to that. I, I can think of two theories and I wonder what you think of them and maybe they're both wrong. I mean, one is that they, that there was something uh, they'd never heard completely natural, some naturalism of it, to something natural. And I'm sort of skeptical that anything is completely natural, so I don't really like that theory. And the other is that there's something that they've heard that they've been sensitized to sort of liking that as opposed to uh, Brahms they didn't react to because they've not been trained in any way to know anything about it. And so there, I mean, there's two different, two different uh, attitudes towards why they might like it, but you know a heck of a lot more than I do about how that is. So I wonder what your theories are, but why did they respond to that? So, I mean, in a way, is it noise? It, Brahms is noise to them because they've had no training, <laughs> right? So, uh, yeah. but in, in some ways, the ice is not noise in what way? Because in some ways, it's corresponding to something. So you would think it was noise, but there's something in their training or exposure that makes it seem natural, or maybe that's baloney, my idea. My God, I, I feel like maybe I should try to give myself a chance to just teach a class called noise so I can really study about this. This is so fascinating. What I thought, in addition to what you have just, you know, the two theories that Peter, you, you mentioned, could be also the complexity of that sound. Yeah. It was so rich and alive and complex uh, that evokes in a way that is rarely evoked in a music class because we tend to, you know, if you think about natural phenomenon and also, you know, the ge geometry that we study, you know, the triangles and the circles don't really exist in nature, but when you look at the complexity of nature, that is something that we probably can respond to more easily because our brain is very complex. And the students, when they heard, you know, after some simple selfish classes and music training, they suddenly hear something that is so rich and, and natural and organic and complex, they just feel finally they, they could hear something that satisfied their <laughs> curiosity. Um, and yes, uh, noise is a very interesting topic. Um, the next phase of my lab, uh, a couple projects we're diving into now. Uh, the first one is called Inaudible Ocean. We want to know what are the sounds that are so vital to the mammals, uh, yet is beyond human hearing range. And that actually led to the other question. It's also a biological question. Why humans are making sound that human cannot hear? <laughs> that's a that's another thing because we use the hydrophone technology to record human singing and playing clarinet, playing trombone and trumpet. We realize a third of the sound that we are making are beyond our human range of twenty thousand hertz. So why are we even making them? Uh, so these are the kind of things that I think uh, probably we treat the students just as much. <laughs> so, I'd love to continue this conversation in some other way, maybe, you know, a virtual coffee with Stefan. <laughs> That's the kind of thing you I'm... Know, I encourage that. You know, we, our time is is up, and this has been fantastic. We all had great learning today, and uh, we learned to both see and hear and think things that we hadn't thought before. So that's what these conversations should be all about. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you. Thank you all. Yep. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Dick. <laughs> Great to see you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Take good care. Bye.